seek above all for a game worth playing. Oh, baby, this craft can take you Hello and welcome to this episode of Make Yoga Magic Again, the House of Majors podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Arulian Cumming. I am a mischievous mage, a lover of wisdom, a seeker of mysteries, and a ritual embodiment tantra yoga teacher trainer, amongst a myriad of many other weird and wonderful things. In this episode, I chat with erotic alchemist Celia Yanina. Celia is a coach, healer, and mentor for female sexuality, embodiment, and empowerment. In her work, she combines wisdom from Taoism, Tantra, mixed with modern knowledge about how to thrive as a woman, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and sexually. I first heard about Celia just a few months ago when I was chatting with a friend of mine about some possible future podcast guests. She recommended Celia and directed me to her Instagram, and I'm so glad she did. I immediately resonated with Celia's practical and insightful approach to connecting with our innate erotic nature, and after listening to a podcast she was featured on, I knew I had to connect with her to chat more on here. There ended up being so much to discuss, and we'll be doing a part two sometime in the future. For now, without further ado, here's my chat with Celia Yanina. We are live. So welcome everybody to this episode of Make Yoga Magic Again, the House of Majors podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Arulian Cumming. And on this episode, I have Celia Yanina, who we'll get into in a little bit about what she does. She can explain it a little bit better, more, uh, a little bit better than I can. But I heard of Celia through a friend of mine a few months ago. And uh, my friend, she told me, I can't remember exactly what she said or why, but I, I found your page on Instagram and I listened to a podcast that you were featured in. And I really liked the way that I feel like a lot of people in, I guess, like the spiritual industry as a whole, but uh, even in the sexuality industry, people tend to just say vague umbrella terms, but don't really get into specific practical details. But you were just like dropping gem after gem of little uh, practical details just in the podcast. And I know you mainly work with women, but a lot of it I really resonated with. And a lot of it even just like helped me to go away and explore more of myself and and then come back with more questions. And hence why we're here today, uh, as a lot of my podcasts end up being that I just want to chat to you and uh, yeah, just just pick your brain about a few ideas and why not do that in the public space so the others can hear your your golden uh, gems as well. So yeah, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to our talk. Yeah, finally. So we've been trying to chase each other for the last few months, uh, bouncing back and forth, but I'm sure like everything, it's worked out at a perfect time. Um, so I thought we might just start with because we were talking a little bit before the podcast, um, how, you know, the, the industry that you're in can be called different things such as like sacred sexuality or neo tantra or, um, and, and how ironic it is that we need to call it sacred sexuality because it, you know, should be sacred sexuality, uh, just sexuality. But yeah. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to kind of explain what you would label, if you can label what you do or, um, uh, and yeah, a little bit more about how you got into it and why you do what you do. Yeah. Um, how I would label it? Um, yeah, I do use the words um, Tantra or Neo Tantra or sacred sexuality because I feel people then get an understanding of what I do. But as you just said as well, it's I think it's just normal sexuality. So I would say 
I help uh, help women mostly, but also men, um, find back to their authentic sexuality and healthy sexuality and heal their sexuality. Um, because yeah, we live in a world where most people probably get their education from porn, um, or from school. And I don't know about you, but my sex education in school was very, <laughs> very limited. So I did yeah. not really, uh, learn, okay, this is a vagina and this is a penis and nothing much more. So I think there's like so much lack of education. And I would say I just, um, yeah, I just educate people about sexuality and help them find their authentic sexuality because each person has a, different kind of sexuality is different sexual expression yeah. and it's really important to find that. So I help film people find their sexual truth, I would say, um, which can, yeah, look very different for, for different people. And yeah. I do like the term sacred sexuality. And I mean, most people think of Tantra also as something like sacred or mm. yeah, they get an understanding or a feeling of what sexuality is. And I think I do like the term uh, because people then get an understanding that sex can be sacred yeah. because they still, I mean, I live or work in a bubble where people are interested in sexuality, right? So the people come to me and they're interested, but I know that the, the broad mass of people, um, yeah, they, they don't necessarily see sex as something sacred. There's still so much shame, so much judgment, yeah. um, so much, yeah. Also trauma in that field. And, but what is important for me is that others understand that everything about sexuality is sacred. So if people have certain kinks or if they have a certain sexual expression that might be different than the norm, that it still can be um, sacred. And how I got into this is uh, through my own story. Um, I've been on like a healing journey for 10 years. Um, I was 21 and I moved away from home and suddenly overnight my skin broke out. So I got acne, um, anxiety, um, like my hormones were so out of control. And I kind of looked for solutions or for, yeah, for what, for like, um, what this was about or like the, the reasons, the, yeah, yeah the reasons why um, everything about me was just like, it felt out of control and, um, so yeah, I went on a really, really long healing journey and I started with yoga and with meditation, um, with uh, nutrition. I, uh, yeah, I tried like every nutrition on this planet <laughs> from paleo to vegan to keto. Um, and I never, like, it did help me to get more connected with myself and it did help me heal in some way, but there was always something missing. And then I did find that missing link in my sexuality uh, that was like the last place I would look into because I thought well yeah my my sexuality looks normal or you know it I I, I didn't know what was a normal sexuality so yeah I kind of normalized I kind of normalized my sexuality which was not healthy but I thought it was like just, that's just how sex is yeah and through yeah through healing my sexuality um I went onto this past path because I thought wow this is crazy. Like I thought this is how sex is, but it's so different from everything I got taught. And I wanted to like spread this message because I know many people don't even scratch the surface of what sexuality is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And yeah, you made a few really good points because yeah, that's the thing. It has been kind of swept under the carpet as like this shameful uh, thing that we don't talk about. And, and still to this day, a lot of people you can you can tell like their whole body tightening um and contracting when this topic comes up and yeah it's just not acceptable in society generally to talk about it and because of that yeah like i mean amongst all the other things but yeah we don't have the ability to ask and find out what's normalized and so you just basically have to go with whatever your your you know your experience is and then often not finding out and any anything to compare it to. So I'd like to ask if you're open to sharing. So once once you started to shift your perspective on uh, pleasure and on your own sexuality, how did that start to change your interaction with your relationships? Um, because did you still, you know, were you in a, an existing relationship when that happened? Did you, when you started to have uh, more lovers, like, did you 
was it then another whole step to start to communicate with that and was like a whole developing a new language around it? Yeah, I'd love to hear about your, because I guess that would be the next step then trying to communicate it because, yeah, a lot of people might not even realise. Yeah. Um, I would say that, like, I did start my sexual healing journey on my own after a relationship because I had a relationship and later I found out that he was a narcissist. And um, in the relationship, I realized that my body kind of shut down more and more. And it was like the kind of like the peak of all the symptoms my body expressed also in sexuality. And I, for the first time, I understood how deeply connected um, the, the relationship I have with the person and the trust or the distrust I have with the person is reflected in my sexuality. And after that, I yeah spent some months on my own Um yeah, just really going in deep into my own healing. And I didn't even want to be sexual with someone because I realized, like, I kind of realized how many times I also let others cross my boundaries, for example, which is something that's so common. I think I've never met a woman who only had sex when she really, really felt like it. So I think that's a big, big topic. And that was also a big topic for me. And um, I experienced sexual trauma um, as a child. And that was something that I then found out and yeah there was a lot of deep healing work um that i had to do and after that my relationship to myself and to my body and my sexuality obviously changed completely so i did attract other people um and it did reflect in how i um yeah how i related to that person not just sexually but in general like you know that i have my boundaries for example i think that's mm -hmm. something so important and especially with trauma I had to learn what are my boundaries and how can I communicate my boundaries. So yeah, it definitely um, showed in my relationships. And I think the one after that healing journey, um, the relationship I had, that was one where for the first time I, I still had to learn, right? So there were still moments where I thought, oh, now I, I did have sex maybe even though I didn't feel like it. And I had to learn to like, to like uh, really listen to my body. So that was kind of the learning phase. Um, and, um, yeah, and now after that relationship, the relationship I am in right now, um, it's like all the work that I had to do now, it's like, how did, how do you say that in English? Like you can reap the fruits or like, you know, the, mm, yeah, the yeah, 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 re 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 the rewards or yeah, pick the fruit. Yeah. Yeah. But I also do think that it's still always a learning journey. So it's not that my relationship and my sexuality is perfect. There are always moments when um, I go deeper, when, mm -hmm. you know, there are challenges coming up. So, but yeah, definitely, um, definitely shows in the relationships as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, because I'm really interested because I, I feel like there's, you know, two two parts to it that are both um, have a kind of uh, development and learning around their own in that you're developing your own connection to yourself and finding out what you like by yourself, with yourself. And then it's when you are ready to, you know, share that with other people um, to, to develop that as well. And I feel like that's any kind of learning. I remember when I was getting into certain practices um, and I thought I knew it very well. Well, I felt I knew it very well in my body. But then when I tried to express that to other people and explain it, you know, I kind of tripped over my words because I, 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 I've i never had to actually explain it. So that was a whole other journey trying to then learn how to articulate it. Um, because you, you mentioned um, in the other podcast that I, I first heard, heard you on um, that, yeah, a lot of men or uh, don't know how to uh, listen to uh, body language and things like that as well. And so I'm really interested if you'd be able to share how uh, women can you know, once they do learn, we'll go into that soon because um, I really want to chat to that uh, you about that as well. But before that, since we're on the top of your relationships, how can they start to share that? And what can they do if they don't necessarily get good feedback? Because I've actually had friends before who've mentioned it to a partner and then the partner's got very offended and taken it personally and kind of withdrawn and then they haven't mentioned it again and then nothing ever changes and then obviously it doesn't really work out. So, um, yeah, big question, but yeah, I was wondering if you could touch on that a little bit, um, for any women wanting to, yeah, start to express that with their partners or even, even just new lovers. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, um, really good question. And I think there is no way around, um, communicating openly 
Um, and even if there, if one person is offended, um, like I can't withhold my truth and my bond is crossed if someone else is offended. Right. So mm. we, I mean, it's, it is a very like obviously intimate and very sensitive topic. And I think especially men have also have this, um, this feeling of they need to perform or they need to be a good lover. And when there's any kind of, um, like rejection, for example, a person can see it as rejection. If I don't want to have sex with you right now, then the partner can see it as a rejection. And yeah, there's a lot of, you have to like frame it very sensitively to not hurt someone. And yeah. I think what, what would help is like starting the topic in a very general way, because, um, if people or if men or yeah, any, anybody understands how our bodies work and that it's nothing um, having to do personal with them, but it's like just something how our sexuality works. So for example, that a woman, um, a woman's body usually takes a bit longer to like open up to be like really ready for penetration. Mm. And um, if you always watch porn and women are ready in like 30 seconds, then obviously you think that you're doing something wrong, you know, and like opening this conversation of, look, this is how it actually is. Yeah. And um, educating um, like that both partners educate themselves about sex and that it's normal, that it doesn't have to do, that it's not that you're not a good lover because she's not ready in one minute, but that's just how the female body usually works. Yeah. Um, and also that, for example, when a woman is entered too early, that this can lead to her body shutting shutting down or like becoming numb. And mm -hmm. understanding this, I think a lover that really cares about someone else should be able to, even if, I mean, it's okay if there's hurt or there's shame or there's anger in the first moment, but I think it's their responsibility to like listen. Yeah. Someone is really not at all able to listen only takes things personal and there's no communication possible, then I would say it might be the wrong lover. You know, like if someone cares about you at some point, they should be able to like put their ego aside and listen to like, what do you need? And um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, it's important to be sensitive with this yeah. topic. Yeah. But no, that's great. Like, yeah. Yeah. What were you going to say something else? Yeah, no, but just, just also be, um, knowing the boundaries, like if, if you are, because there are people who are not open to learn and they will get offended and, um, they will not care about the other person. But if that happens, then yeah, that I wouldn't want that person as a lover. Right. And I hope others, um, yeah, would also like know their boundaries in that way. Yeah. 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 And I want to um, talk about that a little bit more because, and it's it touched on something that I, I kind of got from your, um, the other podcast that you did that you seem to have a like a non-dualistic approach to things in that like everything is more of a sliding spectrum and just I could could you just tell just by the way you kind of explain things it wasn't black and white and and I think a lot of people who who may not have had a lot of different lovers right they think they're either good at it or bad at it right but the thing is they might have perfected like a certain style but then if they're you know a new partner doesn't like that style like they might get like uh, masterful in cooking one particular meal, right? Imagine if someone's like cooking some like beautiful roast beef or something like that. And then they take you out on a date and serve that up for you. And you're like, well, thank you. I really appreciate that, but I'm actually vegan. So I'm not going to eat that, but thank you. So I'll eat the veggies, you know, but like maybe I can give you some ideas to use some eggplant or, you know, you can actually, you know, use this. And, you know, you're right though. And it, it's tricky because it does take a lot of, I'm just trying to think of like a gentle way to explain it to people because, you know, people do take things personally, but I think the key that I'm trying to get to, and maybe you can expand on this on how uh, you kind of work around this, is that not saying it's it's like not, they're not doing something wrong. They just maybe, uh, they need to expand their knowledge and understand that everybody's different in different ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I always say that like the best lovers are people that are open to learn because as you said, I mean, you can be with 100 women or 100 men, but the next one you meet might like something different. So mm -hmm. yes, there are some techniques that most people enjoy or some principles, how our bodies work and how pleasure works. But in general, our bodies are so uh, different. Our needs are different. Our desires are different. And like you said, just, you know, just because one thing worked for all others, and it doesn't work with that person doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It just yeah. means, yeah, you can get to know that person. I think you can, you can do this in a very playful and sexy way, like, you know, making it a game or like, 
not seeing it as too serious as, oh, okay, mm. I'm, I'm doing something wrong, but like, yeah, making it fun and uh, laughing and making it sexy and talking about what you like, what you don't like, or showing your partner. Um, so yeah, I think you can, you know, frame it in a, in a nice way that it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm doing something wrong and I need to learn something, but like that it's fun learning, you know, and fun yeah. exploring a different body as well. So yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I actually love that you said that you can make it fun because I've noticed that as well. Like, you know, a bit of laughter and, and playfulness makes it so much better. And you know, if I think of all my, like, really my most intimate relationships, um, uh, sexual relationships, we've always had so much fun and laughter and, like, acted like little kids and been ridiculous, you know, and it's, like, the complete opposite of what you would consider sexy a lot of the time, you know what I mean? People, I think of when people think of sexy, they think of, like, this, you know, kind of, like, smoldering, perfect, like, you know, super serious thing, which is an aspect of it, like, I, I, I agree, but... Is that your experience as well in like deep relationships? Like you just have this complete uh, release of all these societal ideas of, of what is like sexy. And, but then that's, that's what leads to like really passionate sex. So it's funny, don't you think that um, everyone seems to take sex so seriously yet uh, the most passionate sex you can have is from with someone that you feel completely silly and yeah, ridiculous with. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think like when we feel safe with someone on different levels, then that is the best sex you can have with someone because safety is like the most important ingredient, I would say, for good sex, because if, without safety, you can have the best techniques. Um, but yeah, you, 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 you won't have the ecstatic, passionate sex while when you're playful and like you say, you don't take things too serious, especially sex when you can laugh about things and maybe sometimes things go wrong or something happens mm. that makes you laugh and, you know, having this playfulness and this, this safety with the other person. Yeah. I definitely think that that's really important. And, um, I think that's why I also think it's so important to talk so much about sex so that it doesn't get something that's shameful, but that it's normal. And you can even, I don't know, talk about your sex accidents and laugh about it instead of, you know, yeah, taking the topic too serious. So, yeah. 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 And, um, and coming back to something you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, school, s sexual education and stuff like that. Um, I always think of that scene from Mean Girls when I think of uh, sexual education. Have you, have you seen Mean Girls? I haven't. No, I oh, rarely okay. watch movies. Are serious? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. No, like Mean Girls is a pretty funny movie. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, but yeah. So, and I always think of it as they split the men and the women up as well. And so I think, and I and I see that sometimes in in circles that like we have these women's circles and these men's circles, and the men share their experience with men, but which I think is super nourishing and and needed definitely. But I don't personally see a lot of mixed circles that talk about the same things. And I think that's the issue as well, that we don't have these dialogues, like even just um, yourself and I just having this dialogue um, coming from your male body perspective, um, you know, a lot of this is transferable. It's just relating, right? Because even though in the other podcasts you did and some of the things you posted, even though it was geared towards women, even, even you talking about your cycles, right? Um, Cause I've been, uh, cause my, uh, ex-partner was quite into cycle mapping and um she's educated me and helped me to understand her cycles a lot more so i can support her and so i've also been looking it uh into it a bit more deeply from like a i guess a, a research point of view but i love what you put up recently about because I, I feel like people get very dogmatic about it it's like oh cool like you know in the follicular phase you're going to feel like this and you know in the luteal phase you're going to feel like this and you know when you're menstruating you have to rest and you're like no like maybe it, when i'm menstruating i want to go out and like do all my creative stuff and I want to be extroverted. So, and I resonate that because I've been trying to figure out my own internal cycles. And as a male, I don't have like a lunar map, so to speak. But when you said that, it kind of like helped me to be like, no, you know, like I've, I've got other tools to kind of map it. So, so, to, so to circle back, I guess my, um, my question to you for that or to, um, ask your perspective on, um, how can we start to have, a better dialogue between um, just humans, but especially, I guess, um, men and women around, um, yeah, how to support each other in these certain things and how to have more, like, laughter and have more, because we're all just trying to figure it out, right? Like, there's no right or wrong answer. We're all just 
<laughs> stumbling around trying to figure it out together. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. I do think again, through like communicating and through like sharing spaces or like opening spaces where you can yeah share and exchange um, because it, for both ways, it's really important to learn about the other person, right? Um, like even if you're lesbian or bisexual or whatever, it's j just really important to learn about other, the other gender or other genders. Mm -hmm. Um and to uh in general like understand other people and try to understand them and um yeah you are very right that there are not very not many spaces like that um and i also primarily focus on women and like the spaces i have because first i think it's important to like open up and then at a certain level you can you know talk with a man for example about your sexuality but first i think both men and women would probably feel most comfortable talking about things like that, about intimate things, sexuality relationships mm -hmm. with people from the same gender. And then I think the next step would be like to open conversations. Um, and I was actually thinking exactly that before this podcast, um, that I think you're the first men that invited me or maybe the second yeah but mostly I get invited by women and then it's like two women speaking about this topic mm -hmm. and I was really happy today because I thought it's so important to also talk with men and like you know to open this conversation this dialogue between men and women yeah um, even though I focus on female sexuality just because I'm a female so yeah. uh, I think it's really important uh, for men as well to like Uh, learn about female sexuality, but also learn about their own sexuality and, and for women as well to learn about male sexuality. Um, yeah. So, so I think we, we definitely need more of these um, spaces and dialogues. Yeah. 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 I, I, I completely agree. And yeah, like chatting to you today was um, kind of twofold. Like one, I just had questions, um, which I'll get to soon, which is expanding upon some of the stuff you talked about in the other podcasts, um, which I'll also link here, which is, which was really good. Um, But also that, yeah, I notice it because I've, I grew up with women. I grew up with a single mum and just a sister is my only sibling. I've, um, yeah, just been really lucky to have amazing women in my life, both as lovers and as platonic friends. And I've, you know, multiple times I've been chatting to my female friends and they would share something about their relationship completely openly and honestly. And I was like, you should be telling him that, like, you know what I mean? But she's like, I can't tell him. He wouldn't understand. And like, you know, and this is completely fine. I completely understand. But, you know, to me, that's a bit of an issue that, you know, and it's, and it is a fine thing. Like humans are strange creatures, you know, it, it's, it's not just about sharing. Like I'm all about sharing and, and open communication, but it's also trying to do that in a way that the people can receive it. And so it's like, yeah, trying to do both sides because you can, you can, liberate i mean maybe you can just liberate them and they can find uh, like a more suitable match but i'm also you know i feel like everyone's trying their best right i don't think any men want to be offended or anything but maybe they're just yeah maybe they grow up watching porn and think that they failed at something and don't and it just doesn't compute um but yeah um so yeah do you do you work with couples as well have you done work with couples or um And any of that sort of capacity and um yeah i'm interested in and even if you're open to sharing about your your current relationship um if you uh how you you possibly use examples in that to share because um yeah i think people would be interested in in how they can maybe even just get a you don't have to give away your best stuff um on the podcast but um maybe a few little tools or exercises that you could recommend Like specifically for couples, you mean? Like, for example, what me and my partner would do or? Yeah, for example, because, yeah, because I, I want to get into the more solo uh, stuff soon. But just while we're on the uh, topic of relationships, yeah, if there's if there's a, a man listening to this or a woman listening to this or, or you know, two women or an, anyone really, any gender um, who just wants to start to open up more dialogue um, with their long-term partner or new partners um yeah what would you recommend them do anything in particular so because you yes, asked i haven't worked with one couple like that i'm coaching one couple for example i have just worked with like either the man or the women um um in, in couples yeah. and it's interesting that you that you're asking if i work with couples because i do feel like it's my next step so right now i focus mostly like i said on female sexual but also there's every now and then there's a man coming that i 
that I coach. But I would say that obviously, because I'm a woman, my the, the the way I can help a man will be will always be limited because I'm not in a male body, and I think it's always best to like it's most embodied if you're talking from your own experience. Mm. Um, but because I have a partner, <laughs> I think it could be our next step that we together like teach couples. Also, because I think, yeah, it's it's easier to relate if there's another couple as if I'm just one person and I'm a woman. So if I'm, if there's a couple where is one a heterosexual couple where there's a man and a woman, then the man might, you know, need a male role model or like a male coach. So I think that would be something for the future. And what my partner and I do, that's, that's so interesting because um, right before, like, or when we met, um, it felt like, like I had a, a lot of, like let's say dysfunctional or slash toxic relationships before and with him I've I felt like right before I met him I um I, I felt that my cycle with men like maybe my karmic cycle of like again and again attracting dysfunctional relationships has stopped and when I entered the relationship with him it was so easy and flowing and healthy and obviously we sometimes we have a little maybe argument but it's really hard to say because it's not that we do specific things. And I even said to him recently that I have to like, we naturally do things right, apparently. Mm. <laughs> so the way we communicate, <laughs> the way we relate to each other, the way we live, the way we yeah talk, do things, everything seems to just flow. And I have to kind of like understand from like a more analytical place, what are we actually doing? Like what is leading to like, mm. what is the things we're doing? that we just naturally do so yeah i can't even give a great answer <laughs> to that question that's okay um, we can um we can we can do a part two we're talking about possibly doing a part two yes, so yes, maybe you I guys can go chat that. and in like a month yeah. or two we'll come back and um yeah but i do think like the most important thing that we naturally do is that we respect each other deeply and we allow each other to be and we take responsibility for ourselves, for our own emotions, our thoughts. So we don't really have many triggers, but obviously there are sometimes a trigger moments or, and, you know, like taking the responsibility, not blaming um, and being respectful. I yeah. think those are really, those are, yeah, they're not fancy practices, but I think they're really cool practices that um, help with a healthy relationship because just yesterday we were walking outside and there was a couple of screaming on the street. It was really interesting <laughs> to see like they were, we were even like thinking, okay, should we call the police? They were like so disrespectful, aggressive, mm. um, calling themselves names. And I felt like, wow, that's, yeah, that's definitely not helping love <laughs> to, to, to communicate like that. And I think open communication and letting the other person be how they want to be, like not having this, we both said that we have always met people before that kind of wanted us to be in a certain way or kind of wanted to, you know, to have this like box that we fit in and we let ourselves change and be like some days I'm like this, some days I'm like this. And it just allows me to be whatever I want to be in and, and the other way around as well. I think this deep acceptance of each other um, and not wanting, you know, you have to do this because otherwise I feel like this. I think that's really yeah, that's something we do. And I think that's, that's really important. Um, yeah. And like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I really like that. And I think a, like a similar approach can, that we even talked about before, you know, how we're talking about if uh, perhaps someone was doing something in a, a sexual situation that wasn't ideal, you know, they're not meaning to do, no, do anything wrong. And then also they're not doing anything wrong. It's just not des a desired thing. I mean, that couple who met, yells at each other, they might like it on some level. Who knows? You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, and yeah, I think it's trying to, again, bring us back to that childlike state. Like, I don't know if you've seen that. There's a famous sculpture from Burning Man, which it's, it's mm -hmm. too... Uh, two people like two people face sitting and facing yeah. away, and inside it's those two babies, uh, two like little child holding hands, like they're reaching for each other. And I think that's just like I always think of that when I'm in an argument with anyone, and it's trying to, but like 
in that moment, my my nervous system has taken over. Like my logical mind's like, no, this is silly. Like I love this person. And I, I don't want to do this, but there's like an egoic part of me that it's like, no, but I'm not going to be the one to break it. Um, but I, I read uh, this woman who talk about uh, little things to break it like non-verbally. And she said she was quite short. And so whenever she wanted a proper hug from her partner, she would go on the, the, like the first step of the stairway and she'd just like stand there and he would know that she wants to hug, she wants a hug. And so even if she was in a bad mood, like she, she couldn't vo- vocalize saying like to break the, the tension, but she could like get herself to like stomp and march over to the step and just stand there and look at him. And they both start laughing and mm-hmm. it just break the tension. So yeah. Um, I don't know if you have something like that or if you have an experience and that sort of thing, just trying to, wonder if you well, have any little uh, little techniques like that mm, no I, I was just thinking um to the question before i just um remembered uh something that's that we do often and that's like maybe something i would always teach others and that is eye gazing mm. um we did that right from the start and there was one moment where we we both won't forget that moment we were eye gazing maybe for 20, 30 minutes. And it wasn't even that we said we were going to do eye gazing now. It just happened. And then we were just in the eye gazing mode and we just didn't stop. Yeah. And I literally, I literally saw like, yeah, like I, the God or the universe or whatever you want to call it, like looking through his eyes into me and he saw the same. And I mm. think eye gazing, I also do that in my retreats and like after two or three minutes, um, when the women do eye gazing, they start crying. And I've also had this experience with strangers um, in like workshops where I would judge. I had a very special moment with a person. I would judge that person or not judge, but I thought like, yeah, I don't really feel attracted to her energy. And then I did eye gazing. And after three minutes, I just saw, wow, she's just like me, you know, like mm. all these differences melted away. And I think eye gazing, it's also a very, very honest mirror. That's why it can be so difficult. But if you do eye gazing, even if there are things between you and that person, and if you do eye gazing, yes, you will feel those things. And then they can slowly melt away and you'll go through different phases of maybe some emotions coming up. And I think eye gazing, if you do it long enough, you will always pretty much always come back to a place of Mm. understanding, seeing and being connected. So eye gazing is like a really big part um, of our relationship. Um, and like I said, we never say, okay, let's do eye gazing now. We just, you know, we talk and then we look into each each other's eyes and then it just happens. And this is also something that I really recommend in during sex, looking into the person's eyes, because, um, he's the first man. I really look into the eyes really, really long when we have sex and with others, I often close my eyes. and, And I think most people would close their eyes or look somewhere else and just have short, short eye gazes and we were even talking about like how many couples have like truly seen each other and really looked into their eyes especially mm. in moments when we're so vulnerable and intimate like sex like looking into the other person's eyes can you even do it and i think that's also a really good like starting point to because maybe you can't and that's okay maybe you think like wow no that's too intimate like I cannot look into the person's eyes during sex for more than 10 seconds. And the question is why and what would happen if you would do it? Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, if you're like in the middle of an argument, um, then it's like hard to do eye gazing because you like have all these emotions. It might help <laughs> yeah. you're like highly emotional, but you're already calmed down. But I think eye gazing is like a really beautiful practice that's so simple and um, can always give you feedback on where you are in a relationship because you might feel more distant or more close or it will change. Yeah. So that's definitely something that's like, I love it. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, same. Yeah, I've done quite a, quite a bit in different like um, group situations and solo situations. Um, and yeah, definitely like it, it really can split people because some people do it very naturally and some people are like so resistant to it and especially during sex. And, uh, yeah, like I remember with, uh, like, uh, a couple of partners, but one in particular, um, yeah, really trying to keep the eye contact. Um, cause we got really good at both, um, orgasming at the same time, but like, I don't know who, which one of us noticed, but, um, 
we'd always close our eyes. And so I don't know if you tried that as well, like um, kind of mutual orgasming at the same time while doing the eye gaze. And that's like a whole nother level. It's, um, yes. yeah, yes. but it's, it's, for me, like it was like, uh, because I'll, I'll get you to explain that in a second, but I quickly want to touch on something that you said in the other podcast about when you were, that we'll get back to about self-pleasuring and like kind of feeling like you were uh, like making love with the universe kind of thing. And I think that's the real, like, cause the word Tantra gets thrown around a lot, but I think to me, that's like the true essence of Tantra kind of seeing everything as a reflection of yourself and, and yourself as a reflection of the, the universe. Um, but yeah, so to circle back quickly before we, go on a tangent um yeah have you have you done that sort of practice before as well and which, which practice do you mean that? Uh, like, oh, so, yeah. um climaxing yeah. with um the eye gazing yeah. and things like that yes yes and i i can agree that it's like super intense and yeah it's like i think like in the moment of orgasm you're so vulnerable and you're mm. so like stripped away of so many things like your ego and your mind and seeing like looking into the eyes of that person like this deep pleasure it's like yeah that's definitely another level, like you said. So yes, if anyone is like watching, uh, try it. I think it can bring a relationship definitely to like a deeper, yeah, more intimate level as well. Yeah. There we go. And let us know. That's the official uh, Daniel Arulian and Celia Yanina challenge putting out. So if you uh, do that, let us know how it goes and <laughs> tag us yeah. in your posts about it. Yeah, actually, that, that that's a really good idea. Like to um to to tell other people and to to you know to try it out and then like having the um the the feedback because some people might yeah some people might never really have seen the other person as mm-hmm. you know like in that moment. Um, so yeah, I think that's that would help a lot of relationships know where they are and be deeper, more deeply connected. Um, or maybe realize like, wow, I can't even see that person. That person can't see me, which is. Also, okay, if that happens, right? So then we have yeah. enough of kind of so like being yeah. open to what happens. Yeah, and just putting that out there as well, anyone listening, like it's not like we're saying this is the best way to, you know, have have an orgasm or have sex. Like this is just, you know, there is no best way. Like it's just it's giving you different ideas to play with, right? It's exploring different um ideas and, and uh concepts and things like that. And yeah, sometimes it is nice to just let go or close your eyes and just like completely be in be in the moment. Um, but yeah, it can be a whole nother level. And I think it can only open up to more intimacy because what you're saying, a lot of people may not have been witnessed orgasming as well. And I, I, I definitely know that, um, some partners didn't want me to, to look at them when they were orgasming because they were worried about like their face and their body and their, you know, cause it's like, the, like you said, the most like perfect example of, I'm not trying to be attractive right now. Like my whole body is constricting and like going to oblivion. You don't even know what's happening. And I think, yeah, that is like the ultimate vulnerability because you're not even aware of what's happening. And if if you are trying to be aware of what your body's doing, that you're kind of interrupting the whole process. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I had um, a woman once asking me like she's um, insecure about her orgasm face. She thinks like, it's weird or maybe her partner doesn't like it. And I say like, well, that person is already having sex with you. Right. So to them, it is the most turning on thing to see you turn on. And like, people don't think, Oh, like what is happening with her face? Like, you know, I think there's even a photographer that has like the series of people coming and you can see like faces are very different. And yeah, sometimes if you don't know that they're having an orgasm, maybe it looks like they're having some pain, you know, I think that's really cool. Yeah, the pain and the orgasm phase are very similar in some way, like in yeah. some people. But yeah, to just trust that that person already wants to be with you. So yeah, just, yeah, drop drop the thoughts that this could not be sexy to the other person. Yeah, cool. I would love to actually see that and possibly link it. So if you, um, later after the podcast, if you can remember what it's called, that artist, yeah, I'd love to link it in the, in the show notes. And I'd love to see it as well. Um, yeah, there's so much more in this that like I want to chat about, but I, I think maybe we'll uh, pin that. Um, I'm going to write that down, um, to pin that for our next one. And yeah, maybe in the next one, whether it's like a month or two f- or longer from now, um, yeah, we can delve more into like relationship type of things because I, I really want to delve into um, some of the stuff that you're talking about, self-pleasure. So one of the big things that landed for me um, was that you were talking about uh, an instance when you were uh, exploring your own self-pleasure practice where you 
were trying to be fully in your body and what that meant for you was um, not fantasizing and and not letting your mind, yeah, basically create a scenario or fantasize and and be just in your body. And it just struck something with me because I've I've never actually done that. And that was such a, and I had no idea. And I think that's such an important reason why people should both open up dialogue, but even chat to people like yourself who um, have explored these because we don't, we're not aware of our own blind spots. And for me, I, I, I've, since I listened to that, um, tried, tried that in my own self-pleasure practice and even in uh, like uh, my loverships and things like that. And it's been really, really difficult. Um, and it's something that I've been working with and I've had, I, I have to be honest, I had so much resistance to it because I realized how much my own, especially my own self pleasure practice, how much that was focused on creating this scenario. Cause I've quite like a vivid imagination. And even, even in my own self pleasure practice, uh, like porn has never lived up to my own scenarios that I can create. So even though I have explored porn a little bit, I, I generally don't because I, I prefer my own like visualization and scenarios and things like that. Um, so yeah, if you, if you wanted to touch on that, like both on your, your first experiences with that and maybe even uh, where you, where you, that's evolved and expanded to from there as well. Cause that was, that was huge for me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you're, um, that you're asking that. Mm, so yeah, like to to give a context to the to the listeners, um, I guess that's what you're referring to. That um, there was a moment where I self pleasured, yeah, without a fantasy, because up to that point I had always used fantasies, and I also needed certain fantasies. So for example, for me, sex and love was not something that I could bring together. Like sex and love was two different things for me, and. I could not be deeply emotional or intimate, um, vulnerable during sex. It was more, you know, more distant kind of sex. And um, that was, yeah, when I um, said earlier that I had this like phase where I was alone and I just, you know, explored my own sexuality, my own sexual healing. That was actually the starting point of my sexual healing journey because that was so mind blowing for me. Um, I didn't, I did it intuitively. So I wasn't like I heard about Tantra, but, um, and, you know, sacred sexuality, but I was not too deep into that. And I self-pleasured. And for the first time, I kind of like, I kind of had to force myself not to use a fantasy. Um, because if you, that's the thing, if you self-pleasure, you masturbate a certain way your whole life, that's going to be the easiest way for your body to orgasm. And trying something different will always come with a challenge and will always be more difficult. Mm. But I... Yeah, for the first time, I tr I tried to self pleasure without really fantasizing, or you could. It was not really fantasizing; it was more like connecting to universal love. Um, so, kind of like, yeah, it was like making love to the universe, and I even made a practice out of it because I teach it to others, and it's basically called making love to the universe practice. So yeah. basically, letting love enter my body, um, and like letting my whole being, my energy, making love with love. Um, and that resulted in an orgasm that like, yeah, it kind of pulled a trauma out of my body. It felt like mm -hmm. an exorcism. It felt like all this love, like entered my body, my whole being, my whole nervous system and kind of like, like let everything explode away. That wasn't love. And I mean, it was not just this moment and then, then I was healed, but it was such a big part of my healing, um, because it felt like this energy that was in my body due to trauma was like, yeah, like basically, I think catapulted is the right <laughs> word. Like, you know, it was thrown out of my body. Yeah. And that was the moment where I thought like afterwards with her, like, wow, like what was that? And that's crazy that this can happen. And then I went into trying to understand it. And then I, you know, learned more about, for example, that fantasies, do keep you a little bit in your mind, right? Because your fantasy is in your mind. And I think fantasies are amazing. And it's not that you should ever drop fantasies because they can be so enriching and beautiful. But also to try not to fantasize and to just really be with the moment and with what you feel. Mm. And that is a challenge because you're basically just with yourself and your pleasure and your sexual energy and being turned on by that instead of being turned on by, for example, someone else or um, envisioning something. 
And yeah, that's definitely something that um, I practice um, also during sex. So for example, that you're really just with what you feel that you're, um, that you're, you know, like just, just being connected with the, the energy that flows th between you and your partner. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's a really powerful practice that it's definitely very challenging. And I think most people have never tried it because yeah, I think most people or yeah, I would say most people probably watch porn because that's the easiest way. And I think that's very disconnecting because you're basically watching something else. You're not even letting it come from your own mind. For example, like you said with your fantasies, but you're watching something else. So you're like placing your attention outwards instead of in your body. Mm. And that will, yeah, then lead to like a limited experience of your sexuality, I think. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's definitely a practice I can I can recommend trying. Um, and also, it gives so much feedback about, for example, well, how do I feel? Or for example, why do I have certain fantasies? And why do I want certain fantasies like if the fantasy was gone what would i feel instead you know and that can give so much feedback about ourselves mm. our sexuality um yeah so yeah yeah i think that even that last line like if the fantasy was gone what would, what would you feel and that was the thing for me um initially without the fantasy it's like oh what am i actually feeling like and i felt like the need to to label or even yeah direct it as the pleasure was coming from this, yeah, this fantasy or um, this idea and and also just how it trickles into other aspects of my life. Like, you know, nothing can ever live up to fantasy, right? Um, um, yeah. But, yeah, yeah there's... Uh, and I think... It, uh, sorry. Um, I was going to say, was there anything else you want to add on to that before I um, ask um, you? The yeah, just that if, if anyone is um, listening, I think fantasies are also a very beautiful way of understanding your subconscious because fantasies are not random. The way your fantasy, like the, the kind of fantasies you have can give you a lot of information about your subconscious and your desires um, because we, like most people have maybe certain repeating um, things that turn them on, right? And it's very specific and very unique. And yeah, it's 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 a... It's a good starting point, understanding your own sexuality by understanding your fantasy um, and why you're turned on by certain things, for example, and what is the desire underneath. Um, so, for example, uh, many women are turned on by like more domination and the deeper desire underneath that could be to like completely surrender to feel like or like to give, you know, to give away the responsibility, the control. And yes, I think fantasies are beautiful like doorway to understanding ourselves better as well and like our subconscious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect segue into the next part I want to talk about. And that's, you know, and just another disclaimer and reminder that again, like I feel like people pendulum swing so much, you know, for example, if one side of it is, is not being in fantasy at all and just being completely in your body and just experiencing through your five senses. And then the opposite of that is, is really like what we're going to get into next. Like, completely immersing yourself in your fantasy and seeing it as not something that you need to hide, but you can actually like completely immerse yourself in and, and seeing both of those as opportunities to explore and, and neither one of them is the right or wrong. But, you know, if, if, for example, you might be, the, you know, you listening might be the opposite of me. You might be completely in your body all the time. And, you know, this next part might be for you with the, how to tap into your fantasy. Cause I'm really interested and I've heard of the, like a similar idea before, but you just explained it in a way that I've never heard before and it really like landed something. You were talking about how a lot of our kind of desires and, and kinks are linked to what happens um, to us when we're growing up. So again, like a reconnection with our childlike self, um, you know, what what we were attracted to when we were, we were growing up. Because I've heard of this idea as well that, um, that when you reach puberty and you're starting to develop your sexual self, whatever, like pop culture, whatever first things you're attracted to, um, that kind of, it, it's actually a term that I think it's called, uh, see if I get this right, it's um, erotocrystallization inertia. And it's like kind of like so a part of your erotic self crystallizes that it is always going to be like something that you tap back into. So that's that's a benefit. Um, but to come back to what you were saying, 
uh, I'd love for you to explain that um, the the little rat experiment that you, you talked about, and just I think that was just like yeah, it it landed so well for me, and yeah, so you'll explain it so much better. So I'll let you take over, but you know what I'm talking about, hey? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, in general, um, I think it's super interesting to yeah to understand, for example, kinks or so. For anyone listening, I think it's important to understand kink is just something that turns you on because many people think of kink and then think, oh, it's BDSM. Well, kink can be BDSM, but kink can be something else. It's just something that turns you on. And um, every person has some kind of like kinks in some way, you know, something that um, yeah just specifically turns you on. And yeah, like you said, it get forms. It's it gets formed in our childhood, like our probably our whole personality i mean if you think of our relationship patterns our way of living our thoughts our mindset get shaped when we're when we're children or when we're growing up through our parents through our social environment and the same goes for our sexuality as well and um yeah there is a study that i love um i can also like look for it so you can maybe link it if people want to like go into that but that um there were experiments done with rats that when small like baby rats were exposed to lemon when they're small that later in life they would choose part other rats that smell like lemons so when they were like baby rats they associated um lemon rats with yeah like their growing sexuality and then that's something they sexually prefer so if they would go and have the the choice between a rat that didn't smell like lemon and one that did smell like lemon. They would always go for the rat that smelled like lemon. <laughs> so I think that's that's really um, cute um, and interesting. Yeah, like little little uh, lemon kink rats. I love it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like they have a lemon kink, and it's the same with anything else. That if you're a child and you, I mean, this all happens very subtly and very um, subconsciously. So. When you um, when you're a child and you associate certain things with pleasure and with joy, it doesn't even have to be like sexual pleasure, but with intense joy and ecstasy, because pe- children can feel that, right? They can be like so ecstatic about small things. Then um, those things can turn into kinks or something that turns you on later in life. For example, when you're in your puberty and you um, you start masturbating and touching yourself, and then um, you have this fear of, oh, my parents could come in then that could turn into later on um, like a real kink of um, like dan- associating danger with sex because in that moment when you're in puberty and you associate the danger of being discovered with your sexuality, then later this can turn into something that you um, are turned on by a dangerous situation, dangerous sexual situations, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so, it's so um, interesting um, to like like how people might think or many people might think that sexuality is so random and fantasies are random. They just happen. Um, but they don't, they always have this, um, this, this, um, like, how do you say that? This reason underneath. Um, Mm -hmm. and even for like more extreme fetishes or, um, there's always like a deeper, it can be a deeper trauma or like a deeper reason why, why people have this certain sexual orientation and if anyone has a sexual orientation that hurts themselves and that doesn't feel good because i think as long as you as long as it's it's consensual it feels good to you um and it enriches your life and your sex life then i think there's nothing wrong with any fetishes or or kinks but if there's something that kind of like hurts you or that um hurts others or that's not you know that's it just doesn't feel good then it's important for those people to know that you could actually, I would say, heal that part so that this kink, this fetish would not um, be expressed anymore. So mm-hmm. it's not that you're forever doomed to have a certain sexual expression that actually hurts you. Because I know there are um, there are many people that do have sexual fantasies or sexual desires that, or also that simply are not doable in real life and that would hurt them or you know so yeah i think it's really important to understand that it's all linked and that it's formed through our childhood oftentimes also through trauma so yeah 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 yeah, i love that and yeah i think it just gives so much permission um because yeah everyone thinks that they're the only one or everyone thinks that they're the weird one or all that sort of stuff and i think yeah only only good can come of 
delving into it more and just having a sense of compassion and a, a sense of humor about it, I think as well. And I think that's yeah. the key um, for me, you know, like instead of going, oh no, like, you know, I now, no wonder I'm attra- attracted to um, certain girls because I, I grew up with like anime and I grew up with like, you know, playing uh, Japanese mm-hmm. RPGs and things like that. It's like having a sense of humor about it, noticing my patterns. And I, I think for me also bringing that in that, it's a it's a it's a source of power if I need it, and so if I'm with a partner that maybe like things are diminishing a little bit, I can find a way to tap into that, whether with role playing or whether it's something like that. But then I can direct that energy back into the relationship kind of thing. So it's like once you're aware of where the power comes from, it doesn't have to move you. You can kind of like like kind of channel it a little bit. Do you feel mm-hmm. feel the same? I'm aware that we've got a couple of minutes left before we've got a cut off um so i don't want to keep you but um yeah so we've just got a couple of minutes left because um i know your partner's got to uh do a uh call as well in the apartment so yeah uh any last little bits you want to touch on um for what we just chatted about Mm. Yeah, I just just that I hope the people listening um, maybe develop this curiosity about sexuality, like this playful curiosity, because I think sexual healing, um, yes, it definitely has a very like painful parts and difficult parts and challenging parts, but it can also be like a really fun way of getting to know yourself better. So, for example. I always say like what I actually do is like guide people back to their power and to their truth. Um, and I just, sexuality is just the, 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 like not the tool, but like the, the, the doorway. So mm. because sexuality reflects basically everything about yourself. So every sexual challenge, every sexual desire gives you feedback about yourself and your, yeah, your deepest desires, your deepest fears, your deepest traumas. And it's just the most honest mirror because in our everyday life, we can like um, shut things down, but our body doesn't lie, right? So we cannot like force ourselves to be turned on by something that we're not. And we can also not force ourselves not to be turned on by something that just turns us on. So it's just like a, you know, this, this, this reaction and um, to understand that um, this like understanding and um, getting to know this, this feedback or like, getting to know ourselves through our sexuality can be such a, it's such a beautiful and a deep and rewarding journey. Um, and it can be playful. And yeah, so I guess what I want to say is that when you start looking, understanding, healing your sexuality, you actually look at deeper parts of yourself. Mm. So it's like this, also the self-awareness journey and sexuality is just like a, a gateway um, through that. Definitely. So, yeah, I love that. And um yeah, and you and you're right and like a quick example is um a partner of mine uh at one point realized she was attracted to a coworker of hers and was really upset to bring it up and really embarrassed and ashamed and all that and we ended up having a dialogue about it and like I was like, "Oh, you know, do you want to explore this, etc." And then she ended up realizing that she through this idea that he represented this perfect like he was like a singer, musician, all these things that like as growing up in pop culture ticked her boxes. And she was the only she was the one that actually discovered this. I didn't even mention this idea. She kind of put it all together herself. But through, you know, and then that it fizzled out. It kind of took the charge out. She, she realized what was driving it. And then the actual connection wasn't really much more than that. So yeah, there's so much more I wanted to chat to you about. Um and I will plant one little more little seed for our next conversation. One question I did want to ask that it's 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 Yes, too big question to ask um, now. Um, but how do we know when we're covering up a trauma? Um, you know, like because sometimes it's it's our blind spots. But we will we will touch on that next time because we've only got about a minute left. Um, so yeah, where can people find more information about what you do other than the show notes? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I guess my Instagram and I'm currently like, I'm launching my new website soon, um, where I also have a blog where I talk about all these things and talk about like taboo, (laughs) taboo topics and sexuality or like write, write text. So, um, yeah, so that's definitely something where people can dive into that. Yeah. Cool. Amazing. Well, I look forward to part two and I hope you all do as well. And yeah, thank you, Sylvia. I really appreciate your time. It was really fun chatting. Yes. Yes. 
likewise i also enjoyed it and looking forward to yeah part two and chatting more so thank you for your invitation thank you for listening to and being a part of this episode of make yoga magic again the house of mages podcast i've been your host daniel aruli and coming a massive thank you to my guests for this episode celia yanina and if you'd like to connect with us and find out more about what celia or i do you can find all of our links in the show notes below and feel free to reach out to us we'd love to hear what you thought of this episode thanks again and i'll chat with you again very soon until then Make yoga magic again.